In this video, we're going to be building a super small form factor mini PC that'll play anything that you throw at it. In fact, with ray tracing set to ultra in Cyberpunk, we're still getting over 70 FPS on average. And the craziest thing about this mini rig is we're actually only using an iGPU. What's going on everybody, it's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be pushing the AMD Ryzen AI Max Plus 395 to the limit. I've been messing around with this APU for quite some time, but I haven't been able to get the TDP up as high as we can here with the framework main board. So that's exactly what we're gonna be doing in this video. So the main bread and butter of this build is gonna be the new framework main board. This is for their framework desktop and they do sell this separately. It's powered by the AMD Ryzen AI Max Plus 395. You can also go with the uh, Max 385. This one's gonna give us better performance. It's got two 2280 M.2 slots. It'll support an ATX or an SFX power supply. It's got that other 2280 slot around back here, and you can also add a Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth card if you're gonna go that route. This thing has been amazing, but of course, we wanna add this to a small form factor case, and we need a couple extras here. It's actually not that much because we've already got the CPU, motherboard, and cooler all in one with the framework main board. We're gonna need a fan, case, power supply, and some storage. The case I opted to use is relatively cheap over on Amazon, around $38. This is one that I've used before in a mini ITX build, albeit it was a white version of this case. But I definitely wanted to keep it as small as possible. And since this board is a mini ITX form factor, we shouldn't have a problem fitting it inside of here. Relatively plain Jane, not a lot going on with the case, but I did find this little handle laying around. I think I found it in my garage. So I will be adding it to the case. Just keep in mind, it doesn't come with this case from Amazon, but it's a nice little aluminum handle and it'll just make it really easy to carry this thing around. I will leave links to all the parts used for this build, but I did run into one little snag here with the case. I didn't even think about it. It's got this USB 3 connector for the dual USB 3 ports up front. Unfortunately, this framework main board doesn't have that connector. It's got two USB-C connectors. So I will have to get an adapter for that. I've already ordered it, but it's going to be a few days. So we'll just go ahead and install it without that up front. Just keep in mind, this is really easy to convert over. So we'll just go ahead and drop the main board in here. And we've got plenty of room for our fan on top of that cooler. But the next thing we need to deal with is a power supply. This case only supports a flex power supply. Of course, you could go with the Pico if you wanted to. But what I've got here is a fully modular 500 watt power supply. These are like $48 over on Amazon. This is the fourth one that I'm going to be using in a build. I haven't had an issue with them in the past. We've got more than enough wattage for this system here. In fact, I did a small form factor build with this. We only had a 230 watt power supply that worked out just fine. So this is going to be more than enough. Plus that power supply is modular, so we can make it look really clean. As you can see here, just one zip tie. I mean, it's a really nice little build. I also added the uh, handle that I found. I did have to drill two larger holes in the top of the case to get the handle to attach, but uh, it does work out pretty nicely. Now we need to deal with the fan, and this is a fan that I usually use for small form factor builds. It's more of an industrial fan. It can get a bit louder uh, than others on the market, but it does move a lot of air. Now another option would be an RGB fan like this here. The main board does have an RGB connector on it, and it might look pretty good with the side panel on, but I think I'm going to go with that Noctua because uh, we need to move more air here. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be taking the Ryzen AI Max Plus 395 to the limit. We're going to see how much wattage we can throw at this and see if we can get better performance out of it. But once it's all said and done, it looks a little something like this. I mean, everything tucked in there really nicely. That handle does make it easy to carry around, and it's a very small form factor unit, as you can see here. So jumping right into it, we've got that Max Plus 395 with 16 cores, 32 threads. This is the 128 gigabyte model, and I've dedicated 64 gigs of RAM to the iGPU, which just happens to be the Radeon 8060S, 40 compute units based on RDNA 3.5. And out of the box, this board will boost up to around 110 watts, then back off to around 99 while gaming. I've been able to take this up to 140 watts, but I've backed it off just a bit to 130. So we've got a sustained 130 watt TDP across the board with this unit. Going from 130 to 140, not a huge jump in the performance difference, but it does get much hotter. And with that 130 watt TDP, I did have to go into the BIOS and kind of adjust the fan curve. 
It's a little louder than I'd like, but you know, even just at 100 watts, this is an amazing performer and you don't have to adjust that fan curve at all. The first thing I wanted to take a look at here were some benchmarks and we've got Geekbench 6 at the very top. We've got that Ryzen AI Max Plus 395 at 130 watts, single core 2,966, multi 22,260. This is a phenomenal multi-core score here for a mobile chip. And if you take a look down the list, you can see that that 9955HX3D, which is one of my favorite mobile CPUs right now for gaming, does come ahead in single core. And we could probably get it close to that multi by upping the wattage on it. But for the most part, these are the kind of scores you'll get out of laptop with that chip. And at the very bottom, we've got the Intel Core Ultra 9 285HX. Next up, we've got Cinebench R24, and even though we're up to 130 watts here, I didn't see a huge jump in single core with this setup. You can see we're at 112, a little under the Apple M1 Max and M1 Ultra, but when it comes to multi-core, now we can let it stretch its legs, throw in more wattage at it, will allow all of those cores to boost up higher. We got a 19,028 here in the multi-core score for Cinebench R24. Taking a look at some GPU benchmarks with that Radeon 8060S. In Steel Nomad, we're up to 2,197. And when it comes to Time Spy, we got a total score here of 11,234. Graphics score sitting right there at 11,316. This is on par with an RTX 4060 laptop GPU. Now it's time to move over to some real world gaming. With this one, we're at 1440p, very high, and FSR is set to quality. I tried going in here with no FSR, but we had some dips every once in a while. And with it set to quality, we're seeing an average of 66 FPS. I mean, as long as we can stay over that 60 mark, totally fine with this, and the game looks absolutely amazing. Hogwarts Legacy 1440p had to drop it down to high here. We've got FSR set to quality with no ray tracing. With it set up like this, it still looks great with that high preset, and we're getting over 100 FPS on average. I do think we could go up to ultra with it, but it looks great here, and it's a super smooth experience. I also wanted to test out God of War Ragnarok, where at 1440p, Ultra with FSR set to quality, getting over 80 FPS on average, even during battle. So yeah, another game that's fully playable on this system here. And the final one I wanted to test here was Cyberpunk 2077. I went through and tested this a few different ways. I'm running the in-game benchmark right now. We're at 1440p Ultra with FSR set to balance. Usually when we use that Ultra preset, FSR is set to quality, but it's a little too much here for this iGPU at 1440p. At the end of the benchmark, we had an average of 73 FPS. And of course, if we just went down to high settings, the game's gonna look awesome and we'll get even better performance but I wanted to try Ray Tracing Ultra here. And on an iGPU, we're not gonna be able to do it without any kind of frame gen. So right now we're at 1080, Ray Tracing Ultra preset, FSR, frame gen on, getting over 90 FPS on average. Taking it up to 1440p will net us an average of around 64. So it does kind of fall on its face compared to 1080. And I mean, it's kind of a given we're on an iGPU. We've got integrated graphics here using ray tracing. But the last thing I wanted to do was take it up a notch to ray tracing overdrive. This is gonna enable path tracing. And I do have a feeling it's not gonna work out very well, but we've got ray tracing overdrive set up on an iGPU. And I figured this would be the case. If I took FSR to performance here, we're at auto. We may get a bit more, but it's not going to run at 60 on this setup at 1080 with overdrive enabled. So overall, yeah, this thing turned out really nice. The board itself is pretty expensive for what you're getting here, and you could always build something a bit more powerful for around the same price or maybe even cheaper using a dedicated GPU. But getting this kind of performance out of this form factor is pretty hard to do, and that's why I really love this thing. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you're interested in putting something like this together, I will leave links to everything I used in the description. And if you want to see more on this board here or the Ryzen AI Max Plus 395, I'll leave links for some other videos I created down below. That's it for this one. 
Like always, thanks for watching.